thank you all. Ross, thank you so much to the organizing committee. Thank you so much for inviting me here. My wife and I are here in Scotland for the first time. And uh, we arrived yesterday. I seem a little out of it. It's jet lag. Um, but it's really, really great to be here. Once I heard about this conference, I thought this was a conference I definitely wanted to come to. Uh, love small conferences. I'm deeply interested in this issue. And um, I knew the, the organizers, and I wanted to be around some of the best thinking in this area. So thank you all. I look forward to presenting these ideas to you. And I look forward to getting your feedback. So uh, here's the agenda. Uh, we'll be talking about. Um, let me just back up here. What I'm actually going to do today is to introduce some new theorizing that I'm doing with some of my colleagues on the concept of precarity. And this is a concept that's a little bit more expansive than precarious work. So um, we haven't published this paper yet. It's the first time we're presenting it. So any feedback you have, um, we would really appreciate. Um, so let me Here's the agenda. We'll be talking about what precarity is, why it's important, <clears throat> why it's important to develop a theory of precarity, uh, how does it inform our knowledge of precarious work, and what are the implications for research and public policy. So um, first off, changes in the workplace. Um, on the, your right side of the slide, you will see the cover of a new book that my colleague Lisa Flores and I just published. It's an edited book, a collection of essays. In fact, Ishbel has an essay in this book. The purpose of this book was to help rethink the concept of work. And we started this book at the height of the um, pandemic. Oh, Mindy um, Schoss has written a, a blurb for the book as well. So um, just thinking about what are the big changes in work I mean, since I've been in this field, which is many decades, we're always writing about how things are changing in the world of work. And perhaps, you know, we've been crying wolf, I mean, things are really changing. And these are, this book does review a lot of these changes. What we did in this book was ask people to write essays, non-academic essays, like op-ed pieces, if you will. So um, these are some of the issues that are coming up. Uh, first of all, we obviously have highly complex changes in the world of work. Um, the, the grand career narrative, which was certainly something that I grew up with in my early years as a vocational psychology career development scholar, um, that grand career narrative is essentially over for most people. Um, There's been a growth of precarious work. Of course, we have massive growth in inequality, and I speak um, from the perspective of the Western world, certainly in the US, Inequality is a huge crisis. Um, the rise of artificial intelligence, which we'll talk briefly about, and this whole question of our own relationship to work. And there's been a kind of large scale weak, uh, questioning of our romance with work. Um, so, this is the Precarity Project team. Um, the person next to me here is Patrick Rosanska, who is an amazing scholar, counseling psychology professor at the University of uh, Tennessee. Next to him is Blake Allen, who I believe will be giving a keynote tomorrow. He's a really close friend. Um, and these are two of my doctoral students, Michael Gordon and Camille Smith. They are amazing students. They're not just here because they're my students. They are contributing enormously to this project. And I feel totally honored to work with this team on this project. So these are really, in some ways, the, these are the, this is the authorship team of this precarity theory. So um, let me talk a little bit about what I mean by precarity. Um, and precarity captures a kind of psychosocial experience. It's, we consider it a, a dynamic, not so much a psychological construct. Um, and it's very in, 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 inextricably connected to the social and political landscape a person exists in. And that's one of the key factors of precarity. In fact, here I am speaking about precarity in the continent, which is the home of studies of precarity. So um, it's clearly an idea that has had a lot more currency in Europe um, than it has in North America. Um, it's not that America doesn't have as much precarity, I just think the intellectual world here was a little ahead of the game. Um, so precarity refers to this intense level of uncertainty 
loss, disruption, anxiety um, that has infused the lives of so many people across the globe. And I just, you know, will suggest to you that even those of us who have relatively stable work, or those of you who are students here who can envision a life of relatively stable work, there are so many other sources of precarity. And of course, one of those, you know, one of the ways in which this became very evident was during the pandemic. In fact, just yesterday, a few members of this group, we were together and we were discussing this question of um, how we are managing the, the losses of, of the pandemic. And um, when I was back in the US, there was a, it was a really good podcast by Ezra Klein. I'm not sure if people listen to him here, but we would love him in the States. He's a writer, he's a columnist from the New York Times. And it was uh, a revisionist view of the pandemic. And one of the first things that he and the guests talked about was how much denial we have been engaged in. Like, for example, in the US, we've lost 1.3 million people who died of COVID-19. It's an extraordinary statistic. 1.3 million, we have a population of about 340 million. So um, it's an, an enormous loss we've had, and it's remarkably not discussed. And I think it's probably the same in Europe as well. And I think we were mentioning last night that the 1918, 1919 flu was the same kind of phenomenon that people just didn't discuss. It. Um, so, how does precarity differ from anxiety, worry, and uncertainty? Uh, it's more pervasive. It often involves this sense of existential terror. Um, taps into our core survival needs. And as I mentioned, it's very powerfully linked to social, political, and economic context. The another important piece of precarity is that it has multiple roots in multiple disciplines. And throughout my career, I've been very interested in reading outside of my discipline. Um, and I'm not sure I've always done it, you know, consistently, but it's something that I love to do. So um, a deeper view here of precarity. Um, unlike concepts that are considered similar to precarity, um, we'll discuss one of them is NLV. Um, precarity is powerfully linked to socio-political realities, and it's also powerfully linked to this notion of there being a differential distribution of both affordances and, and risk. And that's a point that was made in, a, in an <coughs> annual review of anthropology essay on precarity that I love. Um, another important piece about precarity is that when you go deep into this precarity literature, it is very much connect, connected to a much more progressive con conceptions of how people manage it. And I'll be talking about some of the conceptions of how we react to precarity uh, later in the presentation. So, yeah, so these questions that come up, and one of the things we're doing in our paper, as you, any of us who write journal articles, is we try to predict what the reviewers will say. Um, and invariably, we're wrong. You know, the reviewers come up with things like sometimes they're really helpful, like X, Y, or Z, and you think, why didn't I think of that? Sometimes there are things like, there's no way anyone would have thought of that. But um, the issue of anomie comes up, a concept that was written about by Emil, Emil Durkheim sociologist who wrote a lot about this sense of disconnection. Um, also psychological states of uncertainty. How does it differ from critical consciousness, which is a concept that I've been writing about for about two, two decades. It's kind of an integral part of psychology of working theory, which we'll discuss a little bit. I'll give you a little bit of foreshadowing of psychology of working theory toward the end. <clears throat> How does it differ from liberation psychology? which is a very popular movement in the US with its roots primarily in multicultural uh, psychology as well as in my discipline, which is counseling psychology. Um, indigenous psychology, which is becoming much more popular in North America, uh, which is and also within the whole global south, looking at the psychology that people developed as a way to manage their lives before, before the colonial period or the colonial infusion of Western ideas, and also intersectionality theory. So these are some concepts that clearly interface with the, with the notion of precarity. And the way we, we 
present this in our paper is we talk about how the precarity echoes and extends these paradigms, um, particularly critical consciousness and liberatory psychology. Um, one of the ways it differs is it links psychological experiences directly to structural inequities. And another way that it differs is it is powerfully linked to um, resistance narratives and to resistance movements. There'll be plenty of time for questions and comments, by the way. It's impossible for me to speak about precarity without having a slide delivered to Michelle Fine. Michelle Fine is, a, I would call her a critical social psychologist, uh, somebody I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of times in my life, um, an amazingly brilliant person. And I use her, her language here because she's also one of the best writers in, in, in psychology. So I'm just going to read it to you. I hope you don't mind because it's really beautifully written. So this is her view, which is what I call a deeper view of precarity. Let us assume precarity to be constituted through systemic disinvestment in disruptions or taking for granted opportunities and material conditions, colonial and corporate land grabs, state violence enacted in drag as protection, everyday violations of living and learning, and the unnerving predictability of impending disaster. And these disruptions are metabolized through racial and class hierarchies with profoundly differential consequences for elites and for those surviving in what Harney and Logan call the undercommons. So she talks about this idea that, um, that precarity, I actually have it in my notes, which I can't see here, um, this second like, definition, I'll try to capture it that precarity is spawned promiscuously at the person, environment, and membrane. That it's our dynamic rather than a construct. So where you can find this amazing writing, let's see if I have this in the next slide. No, I don't. Uh, I will show in a, sh in a few slides, there's a special issue of the British Journal of Social Psychology, the January 19, uh, sorry, January 2023 issue is devoted to social psychology for parity. It's a brilliant, brilliant collection of papers. And Michelle Fine wrote the discussion piece for it. And I recommend these articles. Not all of them were great, you know. To me, her discussion piece was one of the most beautifully written pieces of psychological essay I've ever read. So uh, I really recommend that you're interested in this concept of her so um, how I got into this idea of precarity was actually in a study that I published with my research team uh, in 2022, Journal of Counseling Psychology, which is a qualitative study that we did at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, if I had to do this paper again, I would have reversed the title. This is a, a tip for academics. There's a trend, I, I do a lot of qualitative research of putting the quote putting a quote in the title. And I think that this is just my post-publication regret. I think the article, this, what the article really is, is a critical qualitative study. And, and I think the second part of the title is cooler, even though the person's voice is in the first part. So what we did in this study was, it was a relatively straightforward qualitative study. And um, when we started the study, we thought this was amazing when we did this qualitative study on the pandemic, and we, did it, you know, we didn't interview people in person, we did it actually through open-ended questionnaires because it was, you know, we weren't really doing all in-person work then. <clears throat> and then, of course, life gets in the way, work gets in the way, we got bogged down with other projects, and it came to it like eight, nine months later, and by then, literally, when I looked up the pandemic, like COVID-19, it was a half a million studies on it. And I realized this study needs, needs a different kind of edge. This needs something else. And I was, at the time, reading a lot about precarity, and I realized that the qualitative data was oozing with amazing insights about the, the notion of precarity. So we kind of flipped this. And it's, you know, this is obviously we, the way you do qualitative research is not always exactly how it is in the books. We, let everything come up from the data. Some stuff came up from our team as well. We were going on it. Actually, we were very transparent about the shift of this study in the paper, which I think is one of the nice pieces of it. So this study, 
Um, and so another thing that happened in the study, which is another interesting story of academic life, is the associate editor was Patrick Rosanzma, the person who's now on our team, the authorship team. He was such an amazing associate editor. He read the paper and he said, David, there's great ideas here. Let's talk on the phone. And we spoke for like an hour and a half. And he helped me to reconceptualize the paper. And then when we finished it and we were ready to write this theory paper, I said, Patrick, would you want to do you, you're like, we're already working together. Because we've been doing, you edited this paper so brilliantly and you joined our team. So that's another interesting piece of serendipity. So the implications of the study uh, were that the pandemic in some ways ripped away the curtain of what we call collect collective denial about the unequal nature of the um, of risks in life. Clearly, and I can speak here from the perspective of the United States, people who were poor, who were vulnerable, suffered way more from COVID-19. And now we also see that people who are suffering a lot from COVID-19 are the elderly. And I don't know if you have the same thing in Europe, or sometimes you'll hear these kind of ageist comments about the pandemic. Well, these people are old, and you know they were going to die anyway. And it's horrible. So this, this is one of the ways in which the differential risks of vulnerability become so apparent during, during a crisis like the pandemic. So in terms of coping, these are the things that we picked up in the study. One of the things that we picked up was uh, being in nature. And I think a lot of us would agree that early in the pandemic when we couldn't really be with people, going outdoors was like everything. If it was a rainy day, you know, uh, I'd stay in the whole day. So it was very important for people to be outdoors. But we also picked up a whole theme on, on critical, critically conscious resistance, where people were beginning to critique the social and the economic and political system. Now, one of the things you're going to see over here is people often push back from both right-wing perspectives and left-wing perspectives or centrist or conspiracy theory perspectives. So when I talk about resistance, I'm not qualifying that. I'm not indicating that the resistance is always some kind of progressive pushback. Often that we've seen things we spoke about in our get together yesterday about um, you know, the, the rise of conspiracy theories. <clears throat> so what does the nature of precarity look like? Thinking about the protests, the George Floyd protests in the US, people protesting with masks on. And it's hard to believe that was just three years ago. It almost feels like it was a decade ago, right? And then, um, of course, you push back against Donald Trump. And unfortunately, I'm going to tell you, the United States does not seem to be done with Donald Trump um, as much as you know, he has so many indictments against him. Um, I can't guarantee he's not going to run. He will run again. He is running again, and I think he'll be the Republican nominee. And I don't even know what will happen. I'm too scared to do that. That's one of the you see one of the uh, forms of adaptation sometimes denial, but it doesn't help. We have to sometimes have to break through the denial. So precarity from a social justice lens. Um, precarity is is certainly a complex concept. Um, it has both objective and subjective conditions and experiences. And often researchers will use objective indices to assess conditions of, um, of precariousness. And then there's also the subjective experience of precariousness, um, which, and this is a paper from the British Journal, a special issue, this one by Armano, of this whole idea of a permeating in our entire lives. So um, here, I will, I'll, this is a question to be discussed toward the end, but I'm just going to raise in some discussion questions for you here. How does precarity shape our work? How does it shape your thinking about precarious work? You know, do you have a kind of sense of this broader notion of precarity? Um, and the, another piece, as I mentioned, is the multidisciplinary nature of precarity. And places where I write about precarity, philosophy, for example, the philosopher Judith Butler has written brilliantly about precarity. Uh, anthropology, again, that, that chapter by Hahn, and written up by many other, and written about by many other anthropologists. 
sociology. Uh, there's been a lot of important writing in sociology about precarity. We're starting to see more writing about it in psychology. Primarily, I think this was led by Michel Fine and a lot of the authors in this British Journal of Social Psychology. Critical Studies, Political Science is a great book by Lowry in 2015 that um, discusses the political situation in the US DC precarity theory. So the question about the multidisciplinarity of precarity, I think, is essential. I think that's what makes this construct so timely for this moment. Because I think if we're going to really reach out and have an impact on public policy, we need to have a broader understanding of the impact of all of these social and economic and political and climate, certainly climate level challenges on people's lives. And we need to understand the intersectionality of these forces. Oh, this came out blurry, that's too bad. This is the British Journal of Social Psychology. This is the special issue. Um, it's the January issue, and these are the editors. And they did an amazing job on this. So there was some really interesting research findings. Uh, there was a paper in this special issue on the development of conspiracy theories. And, um, and this author did a quantitative study on this and had a measure of belief in, cons in conspiracies. And what, his, what he and his uh, colleagues found was that um, they, were, they used objective indices of precarity, food insecurity, feelings of vulnerability in relation to crime. It had a number of other indices as well, uh, socioeconomic uh, status. Um, so they also, they, what they found is that the indices of precarity were significant predictors of conspiracy theories above and beyond some of the traditional measures of vulnerability. And Michelle Fine's written about this too, and also Guy Standing, who has written, of course, these classic, these classic book from 2011 on, on precarious work. Uh, he's also written about the rise of various political, sometimes more radical views. Because in some ways, people are looking for something to hold on to. So in terms of our project of theorizing precarity, um, this is our perspective. We view it as a multifaceted phenomenon. Um, we also believe that precarity provides explanations of oppression based on differentially distributed vulnerabilities. Uh, it reflects the dynamic process of people striving for both stability and for connection. That's where we capture some of the anonymity piece, because that was really about people striving for a sense of connection. Um, and also, we're very interested in this notion of resistance to precarity. How do people muster up resistance to, to these precarious conditions? And also, how do they construct their narratives about it? And what kind of actions do they so here's our model. Um, you notice we're not using a linear model here. We're intentionally not doing that. Um, that was also, a, well, I'll start out, when I get to psychology of working, I'll mention how I also didn't want to use a linear model and how my friend and former student, Ryan Duffy, convinced me to do so and how I thought it was a good idea for us. But here we're not at that point. We just are looking at um, three ways in which precarity is manifested and also cause material conditions, psychological conditions, the social, political, and economic context. And this is what I call the resistance arrow, which I'll explain shortly. So the material conditions refers to access, access to resources, kind of traditional things, food, housing, healthcare, safety, um, and also access to resource allocation. How do people get access to supports? And I think the pandemic revealed, certainly in the US, the, the in, inescapably unfair level of support systems that we have to cope with. And it was, it was really a tragedy. I mean, what inspired a lot of the work I did during the pandemic was seeing on TV within two or three weeks, hundreds of cars lined up at food banks. By the end of March, 2020, People were out of money and out of food. 
and it was really an extraordinary statement about the United States. And um, here I say this at the Atkinson Business School, because uh, I also consider I was very involved in development capitalism, but also in late stage capitalism. Uh, what happened? What happened to the safety net? Um, psychological conditions. I am um, showing this this book title that I did in 2019, uh, which in some ways foreshadowed the interest I had in precarity. This I, the book called The Importance of Work in an Age of Uncertainty. Uh, which is based on a qualitative study uh, post Great Recession. And it's, it's a project where we've identified this eroding sense of work and we ident identified these psychological consequences and the social consequences of this. So it definitely fits into this notion of the psychological conditions that are clearly affecting people and the way in which it affects people. But again, this pervasive, pervasive uncertainty existential fear and threat, um, the unpredictability of life, which of course has always been there, um, psychic distress, and then I guess less than optimal means of coping. Um, then the socio-political economic context, clearly structural inequities are a major factor here, marginalization and racism, um, pervasive problem in the, in the West, uh, capitalism, neoliberalism. A lot of scholars connect precarity and precarious work to the rise of neoliberalism, and this is clearly a direct link, and we go into this in some depth in our paper. The paper which is not yet done. Um, there are multiple planes of impact of precarity. There's the micro level in terms of people's lives, meso level at the community level, and macro level. So here's the resist I'll call it the resistance arrow. Um, and what we've developed here are three, not necessarily, these can be happening at the same time, three different sets of responses to precarity. The first one is resistance. People actually figuring out ways like we need to resist this, we need to work collectively. But we also describe adaptation and resignation. So let me go over each one. So resistance um, is the collective or individual but often collective effort to push back against the sources of precarity. We've seen this in going back, I know Guy Standy wrote about this, the Occupy movement back in 2011. We've seen it in the U.S. during the beginning of the Trump era massive protests, we've seen it throughout Europe, demonstrations against Trump, which we appreciate, please keep demonstrating. Um, we've seen it during the, after the murder of George Floyd, again, a lot of these demonstrations took place here in Europe, and thank you for demonstrating again, we need it. Um, so the collective experience of precarity can create pushbacks against the forces that, that are causing precarity, they are creating precarity. And the resistance can take shape from different political points of view, from protests to mobilizing the vote to um, even more aggressive responses. Um, and it's one of you know it's one of the things I'm concerned about in the U.S. If Trump does run for president, and you know one of the things I fear I know many in here from the U.S. as well is no matter what happens in that election, he's going to think he won. I mean, we already know that that's going to happen, and what's going to happen in the U.S. in terms of civil unrest. So um, it's kind of scary. We've already had one civil war. It didn't go that well. I mean, the right side won, but we also had enormous losses. And I, my argument is we're still in a recovery period from that civil war in terms of the political landscape. 160 years later, 170 years later. So I hope this doesn't happen. Uh, precarity and adaptation. When I talk about adaptation, I don't necessarily mean that people should just adapt to precarity and just give up. But when you're looking at these multiple different planes of, of life and existence, people often will come up with ways to adapt. Um, 
And sometimes it's accepting the nature and causes of one's circumstances. Uh, sometimes it's uh, people managing the impacts in diverse ways. And again, these are all new directions for research. How do people adapt? If we took it, for example, the issue of climate change. We've had a horrible summer of weather around the world. I don't know how it's been here in Scotland. I heard it was not too bad. In the United States, the weather has been absolutely frightening. Like torrential rains, uh, heat, like beyond measure levels of heat. Um, we could literally, if we didn't have so much air conditioning in the US, we'd have tens of thousands of deaths. Um, so it's really kind of, if you think about this climate change happening so fast, it, it, if you think about it all the time, it can cause intense anxiety. So on some level, we do need some ways to manage it, you know, to keep on going. Um, and then there's this, kind of, this notion of resignation. And um, in doing research on how to write about precarity and resignation, I came across this brilliant article <coughs> by Nielsen. I think it was in a journal of psychology. I, I don't remember the name of the journal, but it was a more of a philosophical journal. And they adopted a psychoanalytic and critical lens to, to use to really describe this notion of denial and disavowal. And as somebody who's, who's trained as a psychotherapist and has some background in psychoanalytic theory, I totally understand the notion of disavowal. It doesn't mean that we're trying not to remember this, but we disavow it in order to, to maintain, to keep going in our lives. But the, the consciousness is there. So the precarity model that we're developing is multiple pathways, multiple causes. Um, the pervasiveness of precarity is key to this new theorizing. There's intersecting influences on people. And um, there are multiple reactions that can occur simultaneously uh, and in distinct contexts. So some of the takeaways here. Uh, precarity makes implicit the socio-political aspect of, of precarious living and a precarious life. It, it's really very much designed to kind of name a phenomenon. And by naming a phenomenon, we have a better chance to, to do something about it. Um, the goal of the theory isn't necessarily to produce a linear model. I thought it might be very complex, and it would, it would really not capture this dynamic aspect of precarity. And I also would, uh, we also argue that precarity theory can be infused into other theoretical perspectives. So let's think about the concept of precarity in relation to um, it's a precarious work, which is our conference. So here's a definition of precarious work, um, which I probably borrowed from my friend Blake Allen, who has written a really great article on precarious work in Journal of Vocational Behavior, 2021. I think he might read you some of it tomorrow. Um, so precarity is, is a broader concept. Um, and here I have that quote from Han, the differential distribution of common human vulnerability. So I will offer here a perspective on how to understand the relationship between precarity and work, and precarious work. And I will, I will um, just present briefly some of the ideas about psychology of working theory, which is some ways been my life's work. Uh, this book came out in 2006, and it was uh, the you know, really the outline, not just the outline, it was an in-depth analysis of psychology of working, and it was my attempt to develop a new perspective, primarily in the career development space, but also in organizational psychology and in work psychology. So um, psychology of working is, um, was the reason why I chose this title, by the way. Um, I chose the concept of working as opposed to career because I really felt like working um, was something more inclusive, and I argued back here, and I still have the same argument that career is a very classist concept, that it really kind of is imbued with this idea that people have access to work and they move into higher article, meaningful jobs, and that clearly is not the case. Um, at the recent APA convention, I gave a kind of life summary, this kind of, I'm not dying, don't worry. Uh, it was it was an address about my career, 
wasn't a life summary, it's a career summary, a lot more likely, is a career summary of, of what I've been doing. It was based on an award I got that gave me 50 minutes to talk about my life, which was cool. So I primarily talk about, um, you know, the beginning, what's psychology of working as a personal agenda. And this piece will be coming out in, in the Counseling Psychologist Journal. We published a few of the whole talk. So um, out of psychology of working came two specific theories. One is the relational theory of working, which I published in 2011 in Journal of Vocational Behavior. Then uh, the psychology of working theory, uh, with Brian Duffy as the first author, me as second, Matt Deemer, and Kelsey Autan. Um, and that was, um, Ryan Duffy's idea was to do a linear model of this, of this book, basically. And he approached me about it many times, and I kept saying I wasn't interested until 2014. I said, okay, let's, let's do something. And we collaborated on this, and um, I helped him bring in the concept of decent work, made it more brought into relational concepts, and um, that theory really did help to jumpstart and really expand the impact of psychology work, and so I'm glad that we did it. Um, so some of the assumptions of psychology of working theory and psychology of working, uh, work is a central aspect of life and mental health. Um, the goal is to include everybody who works and who wants to work. So clearly psychology of working is, is intended to capture people who are in precarious jobs. Um, work and non-work experiences are seamlessly connect interconnected. Um, working occurs in marketplace as well as caregiving contexts. So we are not just interested in uh, work for money, but in the care, personal care work. And psychology of working is framed as a theory of change. It's a, so, it's a social and political theory. It's not value free. It's, we have clear assumptions and values about how work should be manifested in society. Um, there are three main needs that working can fulfill. The need for survival and power, which clearly captures a lot of the precarious work experience. The need for relatedness and social connection and contribution. And the need for self-determination. And if you know about psychology of working, you know that we borrowed and cited, of course, this DC and Ryan self-determination theory here. So integration of PWT and precarity. Uh, both precarity and P psychology of working theory be a previous PWT. Um, foreground contextual factors. Within the world of career development, psychology of working theory um, was definitely, and is still seen as a radical pushback against traditional career theory. And um, I'm very proud of that actually, even though it was a little awkward in my first few years going to conferences, and I didn't realize that my colleagues and peers would like be annoyed with me. Um, but it, it was, I think they've gotten used to it. I wasn't necessarily critiquing them. They just I felt that the work should be broader and more impactful. Um, precarity is a social justice liberatory concept. Psychology of work also takes a liberation psychology perspective. I referenced the work of Martin Toro, a famous Jesuit psychologist who was murdered in the 1990s. It was a big influence in, in the early work that we did. Uh, PWT and precarity seek to link the macro, meso, and micro levels. And um, we also argued in the 2022 paper that precarity can enrich theories like PWT by ensuring that the context is, is understood from this dynamic person environment uh, membrane. So some of the implications of precarity theorizing um, and we're writing about this. We have ambitious goals for this article. Probably will not be realized. I shouldn't tell you because it'll, I'll jinx myself about where we're going to submit it. But um, in the world of psychotherapy, a precarity lens would certainly reduce self blame. And I've been writing a lot about that in unemployment, in interventions for unemployment and underemployment. Um, in terms of marginalization and racism, Precarity clearly lame, names the impact of differential impacts. Um, and the political nature of precarity helps to politicize discussions of diversity and to politicize discussions of marginalization so that we start to think about 
what in concepts like white supremacy and anti-racism, um, which in many ways are more radical concepts than diversity and multiculturalism. Um, so the precarity informed perspective on work. So one of the questions we would raise from a precarity lens is who is served by the continuation and growth of precarious work? And in the United States, um, you know, one of the ways in which we understand precarious work is in the issue of living wages. Almost a little bit under 50% of Americans make at most about $20 an hour. And many, many more people are wage workers rather than salary workers. So in the United States, we see this precarization of work expanding and deepening in so many ways. Um, and then another question we want to raise is how can psychologists contribute to these theories and to these changes? So infusing research with a precarity lens, one idea I have is to kind of do a fun functional analysis of the latent impact of precarious work. So in terms of thinking about conspiracy theories, think about what is the function of people having these conspiracy theories. I'm thinking about the use of um, conspiracy theories about vaccines. And there's a candidate in the US now who upsets me a lot because I really love Bobby Kennedy. I actually worked in the Bobby Kennedy campaign. I'm not that old, but I was a kid stuffing envelopes. And now his son is running as a conspiracy theorist um, with these outrageous ideas about the pandemic, outrageous ideas about um, vaccines, um, he recently said that Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people have, have special genes that kept them from getting as sick um, from, from COVID. You have seen it. It's unbelievable. And unfortunately, he has some following. He's not going to win the Democratic nomination. But if he runs as a third party candidate, that could open the door for Trump. I don't know how his father would feel about all this if he were alive. Um, the rest of his family is really against him too. So he's not really making friends in the Kennedy clan. Um, so in terms of research, critical analyses of precarious work and research, I think are really needed. Uh, we need more interdisciplinary analyses, and we need to do this exploration of what is Michelle Fine idea, exploring the membrane between the person and the environment. So um, get to the last slide, so thank you very much. There's plenty of time for questions, I believe. Is that right? I haven't looked at my watch, but I will, so I think we're in a good time. So um, thank you very much. I'm just going to get a beverage here. So comments, questions, reactions? Everybody stay away. Yes. And fragility would be a, a more of a, a reaction to a precarious experience. So when we talk about precarity, we're talking about this social, political, economic context and its impact upon us. The impact might be one of the experience of fragility, but could be many other reactions as well. Rage, anger, uh, politicization, um, critical consciousness. But fragility would be an aspect of it. So it's part of the whole. It's part of the whole, yeah. It's one one set of reactions. Other comments? Yes. Thank you, David. Um, the, the threads of politics run deep through your presentation. And you can't discuss this without talking politics, really, can you? But, but the neoliberal side of it is interesting. And do you think the social psychologists, the psychologists, we should be saying more to counter the narrative of the neoliberalist? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. That's certainly what I've done in psychology of working. Yes, we need to take a stand against neoliberalism without question. Because the point about blaming the individual is they're kind of stalking the platform, isn't it? Kind of like locate the problem with the individual. Right. That's the whole narrative of, you see this in studies of unemployment. Um, 
how there's been a whole narrative of, of it's your fault, you can't get a job, you're not trying hard enough, you're not using the right job search approaches. But more broadly, psychologists, I think, do need to think much more about neoliberalism. The advent of neoliberalism, which um, most people put in the, in the administrations of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, so both UK and the US are implicated here. Um, and the idea was to hold people much more responsible individually. And we see this in the US Republican Party. I don't know if you see it in the Conservative Party here in the UK, but the idea that you know people, you don't want to take away people's liberty. We often hear this term, and my wife and I often talk about it, we see these political commercials about um, mothers for liberty. But now, whenever I see the word liberty, I assume it's a right-wing word. So they've taken away this concept of liberty. Um, so we have to be careful about which symbols we let the right take away, and in some cases to pull it back. But I do see neoliberalism, and in fact, in our discussion of precarity, we're very clear about the connection between neoliberalism and precarity. And Patrick Wysanska, the second author here, has written a lot about neoliberalism, as has another amazing uh, location counseling psychologist, uh, Melanie Brewster who's a professor at Teachers College of Columbia who wrote a brilliant article in 2021 on applying intersectionality theory to vocational psychology. She did a brilliant integration of, of a critique of neoliberalism and a critique of the field of vocational psychology, which is, again, it's kind of discipline, but it's my, my ancestral home, if you will, and my current home. Thank you. So I think it's a really interesting question for psychology in particular because we are prone to focus on the individual and on the internal experience. And the, uh, I'll talk about it later, but when we work with people who are non psychologists, there is such um, a relief at simple ideas like CBT, that's not something, in other words, um, to locate the responsibility for changing individuals. But it's also that we can become part of the problem. So, so uh, in the society, we have an absolute responsibility to name it because if we don't name it, we will be used. We won't be misused. So it was, it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, that's it, yeah, that's that's what the goal here is to name this, and in, in across different disciplines to kind of be clearer about this sense of precarity, and 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 really fight against the. Um, neoliberal notion of uh, infusing it all into the individual. And it's interesting about the CBT piece, because uh, CBT is like so popular in the US, I'm sure it is in the UK and Europe. And I've used it as a therapist, it's very helpful. Um, but even in the CBT camp of like behaviorally oriented psychotherapies, there's been a pushback from, um, both a political pushback, but also a pushback from a psychotherapeutic point of view that um, the goal of dealing with things like precarity in terms of psychological well-being is often, um, it might sound strange here when I say this, but acceptance, but not accepting the cause of it, but not engaging in this cognitive battle. Oh no, I'm being irrational. It's my fault I'm being irrational. And there's this view of trying to contextualize that. Other comments, questions? Yes. First, I'd like to compliment you on your presentation style. I haven't been in your presence before, but I feel like the whole time I've been so relaxed out there. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm at a public policy school in the Central Park of the United States. Oh, yeah, what's your school? At the University of Houston, which is in Texas. Uh huh. And so, in public policy, as you well know, we have to do the state legislatures, the state legislatures, the courts, the people of Congress. Means we often have to come up with plans to end what's that. And I'm guessing that but, you know, from Minnesota to Alabama, they would put their earmuffs on by a certain minute of your problem. Probably. Like saying, here we go again, a post of the week, you should be done. Exactly. So, what's your plan for actually impacting people who make these decisions? I think that's a great question. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your comments about my presentation style. Share that with your spouse. I uh, will. Yeah, she's actually here in Scotland, maybe. But she she's heard me speak. She thinks I'm a good speaker. Yeah. Um, okay. So, 
That's a great question. I think a precarity perspective can help us win back people who are, in some ways, when you look at these reactions from Alabama to Minnesota, the central part of the US, um, these are people who are responding. That's why the, act, the, the resistance arrow is important. So we can help look at the way that people are responding. And from a public policy systemic perspective, um, help people to look at different different vantage points. One thing is, the right wing has done an incredible job of vilifying the left. And I think about Mindy's governor. Not your responsibility to run all DeSantis as the governor of Florida. I have a lot of family in Florida, and I. But Ronald, Ron, Ron DeSantis, who has a Harvard degree, who is as elite as anybody can be, um, has done an idea of like making his campaign against the woke culture is his his, his uh, launching point. And I think we can't allow um, people to take away our right to critique things. Um, and I think pushing back against these kind, the kind of naming of the left, vilifying the left, uh, one way to do it, I think, is to bring back people like, you know, say, look, Franklin Roosevelt said X, Y, or Z. Or, like, for example, national health care, United States, the last president who really espoused it was Richard Nixon. We can bring back, look at the United States, the history of the U.S., and the, the Republicans were not always as anti um, intellectual, anti helping out other people as they are now. And I think one way to do it is to, is to try historical um, narrative. But yeah, we do have our hands full without question. And I think it's, it, it is a kind of, it is, yeah, they would put earmuffs on when I start to speak. But with, we're not done yet. Yes? I really enjoyed your, your presentation and kind of shedding that light on different responses that people have. Glasgow is a city that um, leads Europe in terms of being the drug death capital of Europe. And part of the reason is that, is that these are deaths of despair. They are young people, predominantly young men, who are killing themselves because they can't see themselves in the world before them. Is because of the theories work that they cannot navigate, they are ill equipped through an education system, particularly our um, austerity, stripped out so many of the resources that would have really helped them to do that. And particularly within this city, it's had a really, really big impact where you can go three miles and have 10 year difference in the life expectancy wow. for people. And really exploring the exploring the multi-level and multi-layered way that precarity just impacts on people and, and cuts away your means of holding onto the ledge is, is just so powerful. And thank you for giving us uh, a set of tools to start to illuminate this and have a different way of saying it. Because this, this push that it's somehow your fault that this is happening rather than showing all of this the way that work is constructed right. that keeps you out of it. And that question about who does work benefit? I think mean, we have so much to do, particularly in business schools, to change the conversation. Yes. And we're not doing it as, as we should be doing it. Have you got any tips for, for maybe thinking about how to introduce those difficult conversations or those, those questions? In business schools, that's a great question. Um, I think the business school environment is, is a tough one. Certainly to come out so vehemently against neoliberalism and against capitalism. Um, but I see it happening in some business schools in the US. It's not, I wouldn't say it's happening business school wide, but among pockets of, of professors who were writing more politicized um, pieces, doing more politicized research. <coughs> I think that. Um, I think here again in business schools we have to make we have to make sure that the right doesn't um, hijack the agenda, doesn't hijack your intellectual life, and um, you know and, and push back and to do it in a way where you don't lose your listeners, you don't lose your audience. 
I mean, I will give a little a bit of a critique to the left in the U.S., which has made um, has made it hard for people to not use a precise, specific language. And I think that that's a problem. I think we have to do a better job of not critiquing everybody's choice of words and helping and looking at the big picture. But I think there's things that we need to do across the political spectrum, and that we also need to dialogue with each other. Without question, I mean, we need. I need to talk to more people on the right. I need to talk to more neoliberals in my life. Um, I do have some in my family, um, and sometimes the arguments have been so intense that uh, in one case, it's one of my sons-in-laws and my daughter said, "Dad, don't talk to, uh, don't talk to my husband about these issues anymore. Just don't do it." So, okay, I won't. Um, so, yeah, it's complicated conversations. They, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one with this family. You know, issues that are off limits in your family. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm coming from a slightly different angle, but I'm, I really love what you're saying. And as Ross said, you're giving us some words and tools to actually focus on these issues from an academic perspective when we talk about adaptation to the character, for example. I wanted to comment on one of your last slides or, or comments that you made where you argued for including the character in our thinking as a psychologist helps us understand the experience of people better. go perhaps further, I think it might question some of the findings that we find in psychology, especially work psychology, where I think the precarity is still an underlit issue, where we do a lot of research on job insecurity or unemployment or career change, but rarely include issues like money worries, for example, into the picture. And you might wonder whether some of our results might perhaps look different if we did. And I really, so that's just the comments. So I think it's actually going further. <laughs> it might question some of our established findings, you know, by including those elements of the character. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's a lot to be learned from including the, this kind of lens in the work of the work psychologists and bio psychologists. I would give a shout out to your seatmate, Mindy Schatz, who's done a lot of this great work. And I see as one of the leading lights in bio psychology in the US in terms of shining a light on political issues, on social justice issues. She's part of a group of people who I'm, I'm connected with, Lori Foster and Tara Burhan. And, um, yeah, so there's a group of people that, that where we've, we've created connections. Yes, I'm sorry, I have to get to you as well, but I want to turn to you people out and spoke. Yeah, that's a tough question because employers complain that people, that they can't keep people, that people are, are cycling through too quickly. And it's a legitimate concern. Um, I guess my broad response is, and I'm, I am not an organizational psychologist, and I, I don't have, I work, but my connection to unemployment is working with unemployed clients. Um, although I, I have done more community-based work as well. I think part of the problem is the way that our neoliberal system has set up employment. So, um, and this is more anecdotal, but I think it's supported by empirical research, that I've heard in the last few years of people like getting a new job and being fired after like seven weeks because they misspelled the word. Um, so I think this, there's a culture that has emerged in, in organizations of, um, 
not only really working with new employees, not help, not I've seen also problems in not onboarding people, just throwing them in there. Um, I do some small amount of career counseling, and career coaching. One of the clients says, said that the way he gets assignments is um, he doesn't get he doesn't meet with his manager. They, they send him an email thread and say follow up on this, and he's got like 25 emails in this thread. And I don't know if you've ever had to kind of follow up on something where nobody's giving you the context, and you're reading like 25 emails, and you don't know like what's important in here, what's not important. So I think I think the culture of ex you know of employees you know coming in quickly, the expediting onboarding of you know people moving through organizations more quickly has affected employers. So I think employers. Like I think one of the things that's happened in my experience is there's been this push of making you know work life the work life balance and I don't know if you have this in, in Europe uh, you know having pool tables at the office having the refrigerator stocked with beer and IPA beers and snacks but sometimes the, the managers are abusive I think people would be happy to go back to like not having IPA beers but having somebody who's nice who talks to them treats them well. That's, so that would be my view. I'm also doing writing now on dignity. I think really making sure that we treat people, our working, working people of all stripes, of all backgrounds, of all levels of education with, with significant dignity. So that would be my response. I think about Martin Luther King Jr. I just finished this, a new biography of him that came out, a great book. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was really invested in workers' rights. He was really invested in economic justice. And the place where he was shot in Memphis, he was there to support um, trash collectors. And one of my good friends in, my, in psychology, her father was one of those trash collectors who was on strike then. And the King talked a lot about how there was dignity in all labor. And we needed to treat all working people you know, with, with dignity. And I think if we think about this kind of humane approach to working with people, that would help a lot. But, you know, can, can you regulate it? I think to some degree you can. Other comments? I know you had another question. Going back to the issue of talent in business schools, can you comment on perhaps a generation of shift in values that are emerging and how they as business students and they have slightly different positions? I think that's true. That's happening. I think that there is a, 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 a youth are changing, and um, I think that we're, we're starting to see the shift. Um, when I mentioned this, this romance with work, I'm thinking of a piece that came out in the Washington Post. Um, I was a columnist, Jack Shin uh, which I was honored to be to do this big piece. And it was, the article's title was um, America's Bad Romance with Work. And when she, she was brilliant when she wrote this. She said, the American people are like breaking up with work. It's like a romantic breakup. Americans have been obsessed with work. I, I have some of this issue as well. It's, um, not obsessed, but we really value it a lot. And what she was arguing was the great resignation, which is kind of dissipated statistically. But what the great resignation was really about was once there was a better safety net in the US, and especially when Biden came in, the safety net was much better. Um, and the employment market shifted, people began to make decisions with their feet and left bad jobs. So I think there might be a shift, a generational shift. It's a good place I see it with my kids and my stepkids that um, they think my wife and I work way too much. Um, really critical of how much we work. Um, we watch CNN too much. Maybe you hear some of this in other people. Older people watch the news a lot. Um, but at any rate, there is a generational shift among them. We hear it that you know they don't want to work like we do. So that's that's a definite issue.